this is the world we live in. We are kicking butt and taking names. And I want women to have a safe place to put their money. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen, and today we are talking about money and Bitcoin, understanding our money system, what's wrong with it, and the opportunity we're presented with Bitcoin. A quick disclaimer, this episode is not financial advice. Our guest today is Natalie Brunel. Natalie Brunel is a podcast host, educator, and media commentator in the Bitcoin space. Her popular show, Coin Stories, features interviews with Bitcoin thought leaders about their backgrounds and convictions for BTC. She's also a video contributor to Bitcoin Magazine. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to this one. This one is a must listen, especially if you care about your financial future and being more knowledgeable about money. Hello, Natalie. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I am so excited to have you. How are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well. And it's just, it's awesome to connect with you because I I know your show. I know you. So this is really exciting. I know. And I didn't know that before we got onto this interview, but I was telling you that I'm a fan of your podcast and I've seen, I've seen you on like news segments and the way you like snap back to the news anchors. And you're so, I think you're so intelligent and eloquent and and you're awesome. So amazing. What you do is just so amazing. That is so kind. I really appreciate that. I'm trying to do my best to educate the public on Bitcoin and get everybody yeah. excited about this technology. So that means so much to me. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, I genuinely feel you're so good at what you do. So keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I want to ask what inspired you to start Coin Stories and what about Bitcoin was so compelling? Sure. So first of all, I had a podcast actually before Coin Stories because I've always loved the podcast format. I come from a background of being a newscaster and a journalist where I would sometimes work all day, eight, nine, 10 hours, and it would all boil down to like a 90 second or two minute video. And I guess in some ways that skill has served me because now I can talk in 90 second, you know, little sound bites about Bitcoin. But at the same time, you just miss so much of that beautiful conversation that you had or interview that you did. And so much gets left on the cutting room floor. So I always thought podcasts were so great because you just get to do long form content, really learn about someone's background, hear their story and hear the full talk, you know, and feel like you're listening in. So I loved podcasts, especially I liked Joe Rogan's show. And I really liked a show called How I Built This with Guy Raz, which I don't know if you've ever listened Mm -hmm. to, but I just thought it was so inspiring to hear these backstories where people came from humble beginnings and overcame obstacles to become, you know, executives and create companies. And I just thought it was so cool. I've always loved rags to riches stories. And I think one of the reasons is because I come from humble beginnings. My family immigrated to the U.S. US when I was little and I saw my parents work really hard and they instilled me with this idea that you know you have to work hard, you have to be determined, you can't take no for an answer and you have to believe in yourself and get a good education. So I just always loved inspiring stories because I felt like if other ke- people could do it, then I could do it. Yeah. So basically I was a newscaster. I started a podcast a couple years ago uh, while I was working at ABC News as a correspondent. And it was called Career Stories, where I would talk to people within the media about their backgrounds and how they achieved success and their advice. And in uh, 2017, actually, I start I learned about Bitcoin and I started to invest in it, not really understanding what it was. So I can relate to so many people out there that are like, oh, Bitcoin, what is it? I don't know. I'm skeptical. I hear negative headlines about it. I don't want to touch it because I was the same. And uh, then I had a mentor in 2019 give me the book, The Bitcoin Standard. And it is my favorite book. I've read it like three times now. And what was really fascinating about that book is it's kind of a misnomer. It's actually mostly not about Bitcoin. It's about the history of our whole financial system and the history of money, which I had never learned or really thought about. And yet I had felt for so many years, like our financial system's broken and it was leaving people behind and it was just getting harder and harder to achieve the American dream or to provide for your family. So I think I was predisposed to sort of the mission behind Bitcoin. 
And I started to devour all this information and I decided to pivot career stories into coin stories. I decided Uh. that I wanted to interview all the biggest thought leaders and the people that were creating content, but also making business decisions within Bitcoin and just hear their stories, hear, you know, where they came from, how they discovered Bitcoin, what their journey was and why they have so much conviction. And I never expected it to become my full-time career, but in the last year it has. I mean, I've really just met my podcast is now my full-time job and I travel and I educate people on Bitcoin and it's been a whirlwind, but it's, it's, I've literally created my dream career because now I feel like I'm actually making the world a better place in some way. So yeah, that, <laughs> sorry, that, there's so many things to answer, but no, that's perfect. There's so many things I want to touch on. I mean, when was the time that you made that switch to coin stories? So that was last year. I was collecting okay. interviews at the start of 2021, and I decided to go to the Bitcoin conference because some of the biggest people who I wanted to interview, they weren't responding to me. And, and they shouldn't have. You know, I'm like this random reporter who's reaching out, and I'm like, I have a podcast that I can't even send you a link to because it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> and, uh, and I was asking them for interviews. So I decided, oh, I'll go to the conference. I'll drop a couple of episodes there that I did shoot with people willing to talk to me, and then I'll try try to meet these big folks like Michael Saylor and Saifedean who wrote the Bitcoin standard. And I'll see if they will agree to come on my show. And it worked. Wow. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I went to the conference with my best friend to the Bitcoin conference last June. I published about four episodes uh, with people that were really big in the space. And I went up to you know Michael Saylor backstage and I was like, will you come on my show? And I went to an event where the author of the Bitcoin Standard was and I was like, will you come on my show? And they said yes. And slowly but surely, my podcast grew and uh, developed an audience. And uh, now I, I left my job like six months later. Wow. I'm no longer a reporter. I just do Bitcoin. I feel like that's happened really fast. Like it, it's <laughs> all in the past year. And you've yeah. interviewed very notable people, even the president of El Salvador about Bitcoin, right? I yeah, I, I had the that. chance to sit down with President Bukele um, about a month ago now wow. and, and just hear about his conviction for Bitcoin and his backstory and all of it. So it was really fascinating. Yeah, I hope to be able to release an interview soon. But f- for, ne- for now, that was just a, a meeting that a I had with him. Where, yeah, because yeah, I saw a photo. I was like, wow, that girl's doing big things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. So let's get into this because I think most of our listeners, first of all, there are, most of our listeners are women and they're mostly millennials and Gen Z, right? So love it. With that, and I know we're both millennials. So with that framework, like, because I know most people have not read the Bitcoin standard. I actually read that book last year. But how would you explain what's wrong with our financial systems and what, like, how does Bitcoin enter that equation? Yeah. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin. And I would love, love, love to get more women in the space because it's very dominated by men. And for some reason, the technology, it's just, it attracts a lot of men who were into gaming or engineering, but it's honestly just, the technology is about saving. And all women, I think, want to save and want to take care of both themselves and the loved ones that they have around them, whether that's their partners or their kids or their families, their parents. I'm someone who I desperately want to be able to retire my parents because they worked so, so, so hard coming here as immigrants. And life is just getting more expensive every year, right? Like That's one thing that I think we can all agree on, that everything's get, getting more expensive, but our income, our wages, the salaries that we get at the jobs we work so hard at, they're not keeping up with the pace of how expensive education and housing is getting. I think about my peers, my millennial peers, my girlfriends who are all boss girls and they have great positions and jobs. They're working their way up. They feel like it's daunting to think about purchasing a house because everything's gotten so expensive. And so I say that because that is literally the fundamental thing that is wrong with our system and that Bitcoin's trying to address. So basically, we don't get taught in school what money printing is. We just kind of accept the fact that, you know, we all transact in the US dollar, whether it's in a credit card form or cash or, you know, debit cards. But the U.S. dollar used to have a gold backing. It used to be backed by something that's scarce. You can't just make all the gold that you want. It's laborious to create gold, and there's only a finite amount that's in the the earth. 
And so we used to have a gold backing. And then in 1971, I didn't realize this, it's in the Bitcoin standard, but President Nixon took us off the gold standard. And all of a sudden, we had money that was essentially backed by nothing but the faith of the U.S. government. And ever since then, we've printed a lot of money. And what that means is it's not just like printing, you know, the pieces of paper that go out, but it's actually depositing money into the accounts of big banks. And it's allowing for big corporations and people that are rich and powerful in this country to be able to borrow money very easily. And what that does is it creates something called the Cantillon effect, which essentially means that the people who are at the top, the people who are the richest, the most powerful, the politically connected, and the ones closest to the money printer, they benefit from that access to capital and money the most. And so what happens is they get this pool of money, they purchase assets, they buy back stocks, you know, they purchase a bunch of real estate, and they get richer and richer and richer, and everybody else in the middle class and the savers and the low income they suffer and everything just gets more expensive around them because as the supply of money grows and is inflated, every dollar is worth less, right? That's literally Mm -hmm. the definition of inflation. Inflation, And so we hear inflation a lot right now in the news, but it's really not new. We've had inflation It's one of the reasons why our stock market has gone up and up and up, even though these companies are not necessarily valued or worth or producing the earnings that are needed to validate these really high stock prices. But the money's pouring into stocks because you can't save in cash. The money's losing its value. So people who are rich put their money into equities, which are stocks, or they put their money into real estate. And so again, we're having this really big wealth concentration that I think is really hurting the fabric of our society. It's making the average person feel like no matter how hard they work, they can't get by, right? You Mm -hmm. can't afford a new house because it's 20% higher than the year before. You, you know, maybe don't invest in stocks. You have to go to the grocery store or the gas station and you're paying so much more. And I think it puts this really big pressure on, on, the working class and society and makes people feel like the system's rigged. It's unfair. They can never get ahead. And if we created a system of money that was ex- extremely controlled by regu- like rules and, and engineering and computer science as opposed to, say, powerful people that can print as much as they want, and there was a finite supply, a finite amount that couldn't be printed more, we would actually create a more fair system because no one would have disproportionate access or an advantage in that system. The rich wouldn't just get extra printed Bitcoin because that that concept wouldn't exist. And I think it would allow us to sort of balance... Um, this this debt driven financial institution and and situation that we're in and that's my hope with bitcoin is it would provide us with the ability to sort of rebuild our economy based on hard money that can't be debased or devalued or printed and it would be based on the value that people put into the economy right so like hopefully you could work as a hairdresser or auto mechanic or accountant or doctor or whatever and you could put your money in the bank and you would see it go up in value and things get cheaper around you as opposed to the opposite where you put your money right. in the bank it goes down in value and everything gets more expensive so i know that's a very long-winded answer but it's literally the reason i'm passionate about bitcoin because it's this beautiful technology network work that's enabling people to transact from one part of the globe to another with no third party, no government, no corporation, no one in between, just that person transacting via technology to another. And the money is fixed in terms of supply and it's programmed to be scarce so that it goes up in value as opposed to down. Right. I know it, it's a complex answer because it's a complex issue, but I, I, I'm determined to teach all of our listeners about how money works and why hard money like Bitcoin is better than the soft money we have right now, which is all of our currencies. Um, can you explain deeper why this current system benefits like the wealthy, right? The people who are able to buy assets versus like the regular person and how, mm-hmm. yeah, may, maybe just a little bit more. So that we understand. Yeah, so completely. So the Cantillon effect in money printing, it is so, so, so complicated. And I feel like it was almost designed that way, right? Yeah. It was designed to like reward the people who had who were closer to the government Mm -hmm. or the money printer. 
Yeah, so two things I want to point to for that. So when the government decides to print money, it's essentially depositing money into the accounts of banks so that they can then loan out that money and stimulate the economy and put that money into the system. So the money didn't exist. There's no like account that the federal government took it from, say, let's say like we paid taxes, it comes out from that account. No, they literally deposit money that never existed into banks. And those banks either purchase treasury bonds or they actually make loans out to the public. Well, who are they going to make loans out to the fastest, the easiest, and and the ones that they consider the most risk-free? Well, they're going to be the people that have the most money, have the most assets and collateral to back up that those loans and the people who are the, essentially the big corporations. And so you have a system essentially where now these big corporations, these big companies, these wealthy people are seen as the risk-free uh, loan Mm -hmm. takers. And so they get this money and then they can Mm -hmm. allocate it wherever they want. They could purchase back stock. They can buy, Mm -hmm. they can buy into equities. They can go buy up a bunch of real estate and then charge whatever they want in rent. So literally the money kind of pools at the top and the hope is it trickles down, but that process has not been working. It concentrates a lot of wealth with these big corporations and entities who are already really rich. They basically get to do whatever they want. You know, we have venture capital. It's like you can raise however much money today that you want, right? On just an idea because the money is so easy at this level and people are hoping for a big, you know, uh, selling price of their company and like they want to retire on the beach. But like, this is actually hurting the little guy. This is hurting the little person because a lot of those loans are not made to the fabric of a great economy, which is small business owners, right? That are providing the goods and services that the communities really benefit from and thrive from. You know, I would say that a local community benefits more from a locally owned restaurant or business as opposed to a McDonald's or Starbucks coming in, right? I think we can all kind of agree on that. So, So there's that aspect of it. Um, And then I also want to say that with money printing, I just think that it it causes people to think that they should vote for people who promise to just spend more and kind of create this money out of thin air that doesn't exist because they sort of benefit from it. And so what I mean is a politician's probably going to be more easily elected if they say, hey, if you if you sign me up, I'm going to make your school free and yeah, this I'm free and I'm going to hand money. you a check and do this. Mm-hmm. But the problem is someone has to pay for that at some point, right? Mm-hmm. So we're kind of kicking the can down the road with this massive tab that's placed on millennials and then the generation after us and the generation after us. And we're seeing everything getting more expensive because this bill is racking up that the government has created. We're now $30 trillion in terms of unfunded liabilities in this country because politicians came in and they probably had great intentions. I don't want to... I'm I'm really like apolitical. I'm kind of skeptical about both sides. Mm-hmm. But they come in and they say, "Hey, I'll fix it. I've got this. I'll spend billions yeah. on this." And now who's going to pay for it? They have right. to essentially keep printing money and having banks and the government purchase bonds and that gets into another, you know, complicated topic. But essentially what's happening is wealth and power concentrations happening up here and everybody else at the bottom is suffering and we don't have to. Like we could put our money into a parallel system that's going up in value. Yes, it's volatile in the short term. And I won't, you know, I will not make that a light right, uh, right. A light argument. It is volatile in the short term, but Bitcoin's a savings technology. It's a form of digital property. You can buy as little as one dollar and you just put it away. Don't think about it. Don't look at it for four years. There's no one who has purchased Bitcoin and held it for at least four years who's lost money on it. So that's mm-hmm. a pretty good bet. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Um I mean, I just feel like we're in a phase right now where the financial system has been like building and built. This problem hasn't been right building. It's a pile. It's about to crumble, right? And it's hard. It, it's interesting to see Bitcoin as like a, a parallel system, like you said, that we can easily shift to. But I imagine that shift is not easy. Like, I don't think the governments of the world are just going to give in to Bitcoin and crypto. So how do you see that? And you've interviewed so many notable people. Like, what have you learned about, you know, what Bitcoin becoming mainstream looks like? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I am really inspired by the rate of adoption, and I've seen statistics that compare Bitcoin's adoption to the internet back in the 90s, and we're actually faster. And so we're expected to hit 1 billion users on the Bitcoin network by 2025, which is really just around the corner. It's going to come very quickly. And I do agree that, you know, because the system essentially, the Bitcoin network, um, creates the potential to kind of turn the current system on its head and and take power away from the elites or the people that currently have it. I know that might be something that they want to protect and and they want to maintain their grip on on their power and their influence. But I just don't think it's something that can be stopped because I think that as people learn about Bitcoin and as the majority of people, which are not in the elite class, I think like there are power in numbers as they realize that this is one of the most powerful tools for wealth accumulation and for their to potentially be a really uh, powerful wealth transfer. I think they're going to opt out into this parallel system. That's almost like a life raft or a Noah's Ark, if you will, because the flood is coming in from all the debt. Cause I agree with you. I think at this point we can't fix the system. We just have to keep printing money, which is hurting the average person, but it has to keep the the boat afloat. Like the water's mm-hmm. pouring in and they're just trying to, you know, take the bucket and p- p- flow, flow the water out. Um, but it's too late, you know, and it's really yeah. sad because again, I don't think anyone intended for this to happen. And I, I certainly don't want to see like the U S dollar fail, but you know, empires have risen and fallen. I'm sure that the people who lived in ancient Rome did not expect for Rome to one day collapse. And and you could say that for many different, you know, time periods and countries and empires and rulers. And unfortunately, America has really taken too much advantage of being the global reserve currency and its ability to print money. And it has really destroyed the purchasing power of the dollar. And now countries, you know, if you follow the Ukraine, Russia news, the sanctions, what countries are doing, they are literally removing dollars from their reserves. And they're saying, we're going to put the digital one in, or we're going to do gold Mm. or commodities or whatnot. I mean, we're in real time watching people no longer take the dollar as seriously and no longer take the U.S.'s monopoly on money seriously, which should wake people up, right? Because they have to put their money into something. And that's why I really hope to help people learn and understand Bitcoin because it's the one form of money that exists today that is not controlled by any government, any CEO, any specific type of people. No one has an advantage. It is truly democratic money that's meant to provide more inclusion and access to to savings for everyone in the world. Everyone has access to it if you have access to the internet. So I think it's really powerful. I've seen it used as a tool for human rights in developing nations and countries that have oppressive governments. And here I've seen it as a powerful savings technology and I hope more and more people adopt it and I do think we will we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's bust some myths and misconceptions about Bitcoin. I feel like it's a good time to do that. So okay. what do you have to say to people who, I mean, number one, people call crypto like a Ponzi. Like it's all about like, you know, money flowing in so people can make money. And I mean, I mean, go maybe off the top of your head, what are like the top three misconceptions about Bitcoin that you want to shed some light on? Sure. We can start with that one. So people accuse Bitcoin of being a Ponzi scheme. And a Ponzi scheme is really where, you know, the older investors are paid off by the new investors as they sell off. And then you constantly needs new investors and like the old ones exit and get paid off, but the whole thing's a sham, right? Um, well, that's definitely not happening because people within Bitcoin and the the statistics and the on-chain metrics show this, they are holding. There is no one just like selling off and piecing out. People are holding their Bitcoin. And as new people come in, everyone benefits because the price is going up. And again, it's a scarce, finite amount. So once you accumulate a certain amount of Bitcoin, like you will never, you, you, you don't have to ever get rid of that. You don't have to ever necessarily sell it because it'll go up in value. And people almost envision a world where you'll be able to take out loans against your Bitcoin. But as the Bitcoin goes up in value, you won't even necessarily have to pay back, you know, you won't yeah. have interest on the loan the way that yeah. we do in our credit-based system. So 
Um, I would actually argue that our traditional system is more like a Ponzi scheme because, again, it just benefits the people at the top and the little guy tends to lose. And we have these booms and busts and financial crises. And they always hurt the people who are savers and pension holders and uh, people who are in the middle class or low income. So I would argue that that's a Ponzi scheme. However, I also really urge caution around tokens. Because right now, anybody can try to create a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. There have been, people say that, oh, you can copy Bitcoin. You're right in a sense because Bitcoin is open software protocol. Literally anyone can look at the code and copy it. But the reason they can't recreate Bitcoin is because of something called the network effect, where Bitcoin has grown over the last 13 years to be distributed and decentralized around the whole world. And that would be essentially like recreating a competitor to the internet. And everyone everyone now around the world going from instead of www.whatever to E E E E dot whatever. Right. You know, it's like you would literally have to get the whole world to agree to that. Yeah. And that would be very, very difficult and challenging because the current system works well and everybody's on it. So so you can't really copy it, but people create these different tokens where they have pre-mining incentives or they have a venture capitalist who's backing it. And unfortunately, those are more like Ponzi schemes where the people start it. They it's a centralized um token or coin, they take in all the profits, they get out and the people are left holding the bag right. and, and the profit, you it know, everybody happen. else's profits go to zero. So like, I really urge people to be very, very careful because some of the altcoins and, and other currencies, A, they will be regulated as securities and, and similar in a similar way to stocks. Some of them will go to zero and it's, it's much more akin to gambling or, or risking in the stock market as opposed to with Bitcoin, you are literally purchasing a piece of digital real estate. So think of like, think of Bitcoin as 21 million plots of land in cyberspace and you are por- purchasing like a portion of that land and no one can ever take it from you. It is property. It is yours. It can't be confiscated. It can't be debased. It, there won't be more of it. It mm-hmm. is precious, scarce real estate. So very, very it. different. Um, so yeah. I think that's one misconception. Mm-hmm. Another misconception is around the energy consumption. So Bitcoin actually drives renewable and green energy more than almost any other industry. More than 70% of the mining that happens, especially in North America, is done with renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels. And, and why is that? Because it's cheaper. So it's cheaper for miners to get access to renewable energy sources and capture stranded energy from, say, like natural gas mines. And they use that in order to mine. So it actually helps renewable energy adoption. And Mm -hmm. also not as much energy is used as people put out in the headlines. So it's not as much as like a country or this or that. I'm sure that washing machines and Christmas lights produce actually uh, or consume more power than Bitcoin. Bitcoin right now uses less than one-tenth of 1% of the world's energy. So, you know, before we start to moralize energy consumption, I really urge people to look at other industries, whether it's banking, washing machines, cars, aviation, which I think uses like a ridiculous amount of power um, before they demonize Bitcoin because it doesn't use as much. And then the last uh, myth I would dispel is probably just the idea of all this nefarious activity. I think, first of all, cash is still primarily used in nefarious activities as well as the banking system. And there's so much fraud. There's so much, I mean, I'm sure all the people that are watching your show at some point had a credit card that was stolen or they had to figure out something with the bank. There's so much fraud that happens in general in the system at large. And what's unique about Bitcoin is Bitcoin's blockchain is a public ledger of transactions that literally anyone can access. And there's a growing industry in forensic analysis of blockchain. So people could actually probably track down purchases and transactions within the Bitcoin network easier than in the legacy financial system because mm-hmm. go try to audit Chase right now, right? I can't mm-hmm. act, I can't go on a website and see all the transactions that are happening on the Chase network, but I literally can go onto the Bitcoin network and see every single transaction as every block is made. So yeah. I think it's actually a more transparent system uh, than legacy. So those are kind of, I think, the three big things I want to dispel. Yeah. No, thanks for bringing those things up. I think those are the biggest things that people think about and people don't realize everything is public on the blockchain. They think it's all like secretive. No, it's not. All of your transactions are public. And the the energy environment thing is interesting too, because I, I almost feel like there's like a subversive reason that, well, I don't know. Why do you think media portrays Bitcoin or crypto in that negative light? 
I think it's because you, when you follow the money, there are a lot of companies that benefit from the system the way it currently is, and maybe they don't want to drive these renewable sources, or maybe they want to maintain their grip on on that sector or that industry. And it's really, it's really sad, right? Because again, many of those narratives are really false. And not only is Bitcoin harnessing the ability to create new um, streams of renewable or green energy. But it's also creating jobs and opportunities, and it's allowing people access to a form of money, again, that's going up in value and that could potentially help their families save for the future. And so I wish that politicians would take the time to really understand Bitcoin and how it worked and how important the energy consumption aspect of it is, because it's not as dire and crazy. I mean, there was an article I saw, a headline that said that Bitcoin would use up like some crazy percentage of the world's energy by 2020. And like that did not come to pass. We're at less than one tenth of 1%. So it's like, we really have to dig into who's financing, you know, these narratives or who's benefiting from making, you know, Bitcoin into something negative. And, you know, those narratives are just false. And I, and I hope that as people learn about Bitcoin, especially in the media, they correct them. Mm -hmm. And since you are a journalist, you have experience in this field. I feel like most normal people don't realize what's really going on behind the scenes in journalism. So even nowadays, like I don't even know what is true. <laughs> when I see like news and headlines, I it's hard to know what to believe, especially since 2020. I just feel like the world is so, I don't know. So what is your advice just in general <laughs> for people? Yeah, no, I mean, it's such a great point. And I have to be honest, like, I felt like I was becoming so jaded as a reporter. Um, You know, I would cover politics a lot on local and national levels. And again, I want to, I want to caution and I do want to say, I I do think that most people who run for office have good intentions. They want to do the right thing. But I think that the system is so programmed and engineered to corrupt and to benefit, you know, the people who have power and the people who make certain connections and offer favors to certain people. And so I'm just very skeptical and wary of every politician. I literally don't care if they're right or left. I just look at them with kind of a slanted eye, Mm -hmm. like, what is your real, you know, agenda here? Because I've also seen throughout my years as a reporter, politicians come in and make certain promises and blame this guy or that guy or this woman. And then they just continue. The problem gets bigger under their leadership and they have to spend more money. Like here in California, perfect example, homelessness, like poverty, homelessness, the cost of living. Every year, someone's like, it's this guy's fault. It's this person's Mm -hmm. fault. It's this person's fault. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to spend billions to create new housing and da, da, da. Well, guess what? Every single year, our problem's getting bigger. And I don't know where the money went. Clearly some rich developers got it, uh, but it's not helping the actual problem. So something's fundamentally wrong. And I'm just so skeptical of politics and what these people say. And so I think that filters into the media because I think today we have a situation where the media is a little bit too close to to politics. Uh, I think they're, they reinforce narratives that are coming out of the elected offices and the White House without being as skeptical as they need to be, without holding their feet to the fire and asking more questions. And I don't know where that changed. I don't know why that is, because I always saw journalism as a very noble profession to be kind of like that fourth, fourth branch of government and serve as a watchdog. And it's one of the things that attracted me to the industry. But I just don't see that happening anymore. I see it kind of like, this agency said this, or the White House said this, so blah, it's fact. And it's like, Mm -hmm. no, it's not. You know, we have to dig in a little bit more because a lot of these people are, you know, essentially doing PR to make the government or whatever they did in elected office sound better than it actually is. And what's also disappointing that I'm sure you've noticed is these politicians keep failing up and they're in office like 30, 40 years. And no one, you know, even if scandals have come out or they've wasted public money, they just keep moving up in terms of salary and position and (laughs) retire on a fat pension or never retire because they're like 80 and still in office. (laughs) And like what, you know, has the average person benefited from having them in office? And it's so hard to get incumbents out. So I, yeah, I, I became kind of skeptical of my own industry and it's been really rewarding to go out on my own because I can choose the content, the stories, I can really vet it. I take personal care and responsibility in doing that. So I guess I would just urge people to be more um, skeptical and to question things more and do their own homework. And there are so many... I know it's so saturated, right? We have so much information out there, so many channels, but like find one that you trust, that you feel like is actually 
telling you something without an agenda to just make money and wanting to help you. And there are sources like that, whether they're independent or maybe they are within the, the, the mass communication, mass media world, like find those sources. Um, but always, you know, we have that saying in Bitcoin, don't trust verify, like Mm -hmm. take the information in, but always question it and try to verify it for yourself. So I hope that advice helps. Yeah, no, that's great advice. It's hard I, it can be hard to know how to function. And this is when I hear you talk about that, it just makes me so like frustrated, but like, I don't even know what I can do about it. <laughs> I you know. know, I know <laughs> that, well, that's, you know, honestly, I, I love that you said that because that's one of the things that's given me so much, um, hope and lightness is when I found Bitcoin, because before Bitcoin, I saw our country getting more and more divided. I was mm-hmm. reporting on these stories where, you know, every year the problems are getting worse. I'm reporting on the same you know, horrible situation, but with different faces. And it's it's hard not to like, you know, internalize a lot of that and feel like the future feels hopeless. Like my friends can't afford houses and they don't want kids because they can't afford families. And like poverty's increasing, homelessness is increasing. And I literally saw the world through this very gloomy lens. And I was like, I, I, you know, this is difficult. Like, I don't know how we get out of this and I don't know how to get to that place where you're, you're one of the people that don't have to worry about this problem. And then I discovered Bitcoin and it was literally this beacon of hope for me where we can change the system. We can change it through technology. We can have a system of regulations and rules without these rulers that are just taking advantage of all of us. And it's, it's, providing us with the hope that we could plan for a future and provide and save and like invest in our lives and our families. So I don't know, Bitcoin makes me really excited and feel good about the idea of the future. Whereas before I, I felt like, I don't know, like how am I, how am I going to survive in this crazy world? <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. I think I agree with you completely that Bitcoin is, like you said earlier, a life raft for so many people. And I think people, not enough people realize that they don't, not enough people realize the power that it has to, you know, to keep growing and to, to be a very reliable, like place to put your money. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about like the big trends happening right now and like to come either in Bitcoin or in the economy, you know, economy of the whole macroeconomics, because yeah. you, I feel like your lens of the world, you're living in the future essentially, and you're bringing the people from the p- present to the future. Yes, so what, <laughs> what is to come? What should we expect? And how do we prepare for what's to come? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I feel like so many people still need to learn about Bitcoin. So that's sort of where I've I've decided my mission is, is to bring mm-hmm. the people that don't understand it and own none of it or, or are very skeptical still yeah. to really embrace it and, and feel a little bit more comfortable understanding how the technology network was built and why and why our financial system sort of broken. So I'm really passionate about that because I think that once people get on the Bitcoin standard and start to accumulate, then they can start to plan for a future where they can make investments or think about, you know, the kind of job that would make them feel really fulfilled and um, what kind of goods and services that they can provide. I just think it spurs, I think saving in general, being able to save for your future just spurs the ability to plan, to innovate, to become entrepreneurs, to take risk. And I just, I see that as like a world of a lot of potential and a lot of beauty and opportunities. Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor. So this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress, not to mention sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, or overeating. With the way our modern lives are, stress seeps into our everyday in so many ways. Technology, notifications, endless to-do lists. A lot of us have gotten in the habit of being stressed all the time because we forget or don't even know how to relax our bodies. So in a world that's telling you to do more, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, do less, and maybe try some therapy. I've been using BetterHelp for the past couple years, and through therapy, I've been healing my tendencies to put too much pressure on myself. When you're so used to functioning one way, it becomes the norm. And so it's helpful to have someone come in and tell you that you can change how your mind has been wired, and it's okay to relax. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and live chat sessions, and it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. 
If you want to give it a try, BetterHelp is giving the Lavender Lifestyle listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash T-L-L. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. For me, I just, I think that in the future, there's going to be a lot more opportunity, especially economic opportunity, because we have a system now of hard money that goes up in value. I think that it will drive opportunity in different countries like El Salvador that was the first to adopt Bitcoin. And I also think it's going to drive a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation and competitiveness here in America where we have a ton of mining and we have companies that are being built to to support infrastructure and to support um, things like the Lightning Network, which allow people to transact really quickly and have the transactions settle more quickly on a secondary layer, essentially, of Bitcoin. So I think there's just going to be a lot more adoption, a lot more opportunity to spend your Bitcoin in different places, earn income in the form of Bitcoin, uh, purchase a house maybe while using Bitcoin as collateral for, for your loan. I just see a lot of growth in the space in the future. And I just think that it starts with just like that, that accumulation, dollar cost averaging, just purchasing a little so that you can start to save and watch it grow in the future. Mm-hmm. And I just really encourage people to really take, I mean, really take inventory. Like, where am I putting my money? And is right. it serving me? And am I worried about it? And how much, how has it performed in comparison to Bitcoin? You know, maybe do a little <laughs> yeah. chart comparison. Um, because I, I would love to live in a world where I literally like you have your job, you're passionate about your podcast, right? You make your money mm-hmm. and then you put it somewhere where it goes up in value and you don't need yeah. to sit there and become like an options trader or a day trader or a portfolio <laughs> Yeah, you manager. don't have to worry about it. Like, like you've trust that it will still be there and it will keep growing. Yeah. yeah. I, that's, yeah. So that I think that's great. And <laughs> I mean, that's another thing that most people probably didn't realize until recently is just inflation keeps devaluing your money if you leave it in the bank. Yep. Um, so I want to go back to what you mentioned, dollar cost averaging. So mm-hmm. yeah, can you explain what that is? And yes. is that the best way for people to get started with Bitcoin? Yes. So love this question. Okay. So a lot of people think that you have to purchase one Bitcoin. And so if you can't afford a $40,000 Bitcoin, you're out of the mix and you have to gamble on one of these other tokens. So that's absolutely not true. So one Bitcoin is, it can be divided into what we call Satoshis or SATs. And one Bitcoin is a hundred million Satoshis. So today you can get a lot of Satoshis for very, (laughs) very, very cheap. (laughs) So you can purchase as little as a dollar's worth of Bitcoin or $10 or $15. And because the price is volatile and it goes up one day, it goes down the next day, dollar cost averaging is basically saying, okay, I'm going to put in, let's say $10 every single week or $50 or a hundred, whatever you can afford. And basically you purchase that amount automatically and it hits different price levels. So maybe one week you bought it a little high, but the next week you bought it kind of low. And so at the end of the year, you sort of have a dollar cost average, your average price per Bitcoin that takes advantage of sort of the swings in either direction, but you don't have to, you don't have to really time the market. You just kind of put, put money in at the same time every single week or month and allow it to accumulate over time. And I mentioned earlier, if you look at the performance chart of Bitcoin, not only has it outperformed literally every single other asset over the last 10 years, the S&P, Apple stock, Google, Tesla, all of it, Mm -hmm. but also within a four-year period, if you purchase Bitcoin at any price, after four years, you have not lost money. Whereas with other assets and tokens and all of that, you can't say the same. But literally, if you hold it for a four-year period... um, people have only made money in Bitcoin, which which is great to hear because yeah. what you said is absolutely true, right? You, if you put your money into Chase, at, at the end of the year, you get 0.001% interest, so maybe a couple <laughs> pennies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and with inflation, you lost six, seven, however much percent inflation is. So, yeah. you know, you're trying to, you're trying to outrace inflation at this point and Bitcoin, it, the performance has really just spoken for itself. So volatile in the short term, but you can take advantage of it in either direction through dollar cost averaging, and then just zoom out. You just have to have a long time horizon and see right. it as a long-term investment. Right. Love it. Thanks for that advice. And then lastly, I do want to talk about like getting more women in crypto and your experience Mm -hmm. as a woman in this space. Cause I mean, you caught my attention because you're a woman. There's, it's hard to find women who are bold enough to do what you do and talk about Bitcoin. So, so yeah, your, your thoughts and experience on that. Yeah. So this is uh, an area that I'm super passionate about as well, because I just think that Bitcoin sometimes feels overwhelming or intimidating or geeky or too techy for women. And I 
think I looked at it that way at one point too. But it's super approachable because literally all you have to look at it as is a savings technology, a way for you to take your money that you earn and put it somewhere that is um, a form of property and that's going up in value and that allows you to plan for your future. I think that's so important for women because we all work really, really hard. We all have different aspirations and ambitions. And so many of my girlfriends, like I admire them so much. They're just kicking butt. They're up early. They're, you know, out late, like they're making more than their boyfriends, you know, like (laughs) this is the world we live in. We are kicking butt and taking names. And I want women to have a safe place to put their money. I, I really want that. And so the space right now is about 85% men, 15% women. It's growing, yeah. but Bitcoin has no gender. It has no nationality. It has no language. Like Bitcoin's for everyone. And I just really encourage women to take the time to study it a little bit and embrace it as this like great tool for savings so that they can afford what they want to afford. You know, we all yeah. have things that we want to spend our money on, whether it's vacation. Like for me, it's vacations. Like I want to yes. take some nice <laughs> trips that I can enjoy. I love, you know, a good experience. And I want to be able to plan for my children in the future. Um, there are some, you know, beautiful clothes that I'd like to have. I I mean, it's just so hard to plan for that today, I think in our current system and Bitcoin, I think offers us a chance to really be able to save. And Mm -hmm. so I hope more women embrace it and join us so that we can have, you know, cool, cool girl gang in this space. (laughs) I'm all for it. Sign me up. Um, I love that you position it as like the perspective is it's a savings technology because I think most people would think, oh, Bitcoin is like investing in something very risky. And and I think women shy away from talking about investing in finance because it's just that I think that's just how the proportion of people are and completely. uh, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin attracts a lot of traders, which is very male dominated. Bitcoin attracts a lot of engineers because it's literally engineered program money. Mm. That's male dominated. Mm -hmm. It attracts a lot of people who are gamers. That's predominantly male dominated. And I will, you know, when you move all of that aside, you realize that at the end of the day, Bitcoin is literally a turbocharged savings account. It is like plugging your money that you make into a charger and supercharging it for the future so that you can you can plan and and, and relax a little bit. Uh, so I, I really am excited about that. And, um, you know, one thing that I do want to say is I want to kind of create more women's events and, um, just allow us to network. Cause I think the power for women of community is just really strong and, and it's really important to us. And so I held an event in Miami at the Bitcoin conference, like two weeks ago, it was the women in Bitcoin brunch. And we filled up this, this beautiful hotel restaurant with all these women who are passionate about Bitcoin. Some know more about it. Some know less, you know, some, you know, had their partners, just like get them in. But like, it was so awesome just to connect and network and see that we can be passionate about this too and get excited and bring more women in. So I think there's so much opportunity there and I definitely want to do whatever I can to drive adoption with women for sure. (laughs) Definitely. Since we're entering kind of like a new system with Bitcoin, it's like, we want to give ourselves that chance to level the playing field because our current system, there's that disparity, right? That Mm -hmm. income gap and that yeah. So, so this is our chance. If we want to level the playing field, like get in, learn about it. Don't don't shy away from it because it's already eighty five percent men. Mm-hmm. You are mm-hmm. so spot on. That is the perfect way to look at it. The people who are the earliest adopters of any technology benefit from it the most, mm-hmm. right? Like if you purchased Google stock back in the nineties you're on fire right now, right? Like you're doing well. So the, the women who get it, this is a huge, huge economic and financial opportunity. It is probably the greatest financial opportunity for this sort of wealth transfer right. that's ever existed. So I want more women to come on board because we need women that mm-hmm. have the ability to preserve the value of what they earn. And and they deserve that. And we work really hard. So I yeah, I would love for more women to get into the space for sure. Definitely. And my last question for you is, has there been any surprising, I guess, what's the most surprising or interesting thing that you've learned since diving into Bitcoin and doing your podcast? Oh gosh. I mean, I just, I love that this is such a learning process constantly. Like I feel like I'm always learning more with Bitcoin, but I do really think that for me, the biggest eye opener and the most compelling argument for why we need something like Bitcoin and it can save us from a lot of the problems that exist is really understanding money printing and and how our current system works. Because Nobody tells this to you in school. Mm -hmm. Nobody tells it to you on the news. I I went to really good schools. My parents like made me work really, really hard. So I went to 
good universities here in America. And I worked really, really hard and I studied, I got good grades. And I also worked in traditional news. I worked for media outlets and covered everything under the sun. And yet I never learned about money printing and how our system historically was set up until I learned about Bitcoin. So that's what I really, you know, that's what I hope to help people understand because I get it. Like none of us have this information. It's like hidden Mm -hmm. from us because it's just the way we sort of accepted the system to be. Like even my education, I went to USC, I I majored in business and I took economics classes, right? And I learned in the Bitcoin standard that there's different schools of economics and what we're taught in college is like the the school of economics that believes in money printing. Like there's different beliefs and it's it's not hard fact it's not truth they're just theories and so we've been functioning off of just a guy's theory and that theory could be wrong it's it's messing everything up and that's that's something that yeah we're not taught we don't realize that our books could be biased our books could be wrong (laughs) yeah Yeah. no that's that's so true I'm glad you brought that up yeah you I mean this you know for for people that are not super familiar with Bitcoin or haven't read the Bitcoin standard talking about like Keynesian versus Austrian economics is probably going to sound I'm like, what are they talking about? Yeah. But it's so fascinating when you learn about it because and there the are, there are different schools of this. Like it's incredible yeah. how, yeah, how influential these theories are and nobody really knows where this, like our money and our system comes from. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I heard a really great interview with Michael Saylor just a couple days ago. He was on a podcast and guys, I'm constantly learning and like devouring stuff in this space. Like it doesn't stop, right? Like I'm constantly trying to learn and understand more. And Michael Saylor said something about how he would give a D rating to the current economists that exists because they do all have this mentality of it's good for government to just spend. It's okay to have inflation. And the result has been a world where the purchasing power of our dollar is constantly decreasing and the cost of everything around us is going up. So it leads to people being very frustrated and unable to afford a life when they graduate school. And so he pointed to, you know, the idea of real estate going up. He says that traditional economists and the media say that that's a good thing, right? The real estate market's going up. So that's supposed to be healthy and good. But how does that help, you know, a kid that's graduating from college, entering the working world who wants to buy a house and can't? and has to become a renter and pay way too much of his income on rent to some rich landlord, right? Like all of a sudden our system is so skewed and what's supposed to be good is bad, but what's bad is supposedly good. And I really urge people to question that. And by digging into Bitcoin, you question those things and you Mm -hmm. realize that like we could create a better system. We could create a more fair system with more (laughs) opportunity and it is time. You're right. So yeah, I'm really excited about Bitcoin for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge today, Natalie. I had so much fun. Lastly, where can our listeners find you? Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. I I really congratulate you on what you're doing and all your success. So I hope we can chat again. Um, I'm really active on Twitter at Nat Brunel. I have my podcast, which is on YouTube and podcast platforms. It's called Coin Stories, where I interview thought leaders within the Bitcoin space. And you can connect with me on talkingbitcoin.com. So... A lot of different ways to connect. (laughs) Thank you so much. And everybody, I'll link all of her links in the show notes down below. Make sure to check her out. Natalie (laughs) Brunel. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.